In a blaze of propaganda, the German Messerschmitt 109, the fighter which would soon challenge the Spitfire, breaks the world land plane record at 379 miles per hour. It was in fact a special aircraft, though the Germans claimed it only to be a slightly modified service ME-109. The record-breaking pilot was an engineer, Dr. Hermann Wurster. The Luftwaffe began serious training as soon as Hitler came to power. The pupils were hand-picked and learned to fly the Messerschmitt, a professional's aircraft. There were no weekend biggles here. It was not until July 1938 that 19 Squadron converted from gauntlet biplanes to become the first RAF Spitfire Squadron. The CO, Squadron Leader Eilif Cousins. The squadron morale wasn't exactly high because after all the gauntlet wasn't fast enough to run away from the Messerschmitt. And so after a certain amount of um, wheeling and dealing with fighter command, I managed to get the first allocation of the Spitfires. And I collected one and so on, and the great point was, um, could the average pilot fly a Spitfire without any dual, because there were no dual Spitfires. So consequently, we had an indoctrination program whereby he watched somebody take off who knew, who knew the ropes. Uh, and, of course, read the manual and had hints and tips and so on and gave him a pat on the back and said, it's, your, it's all yours. One unlikely pupil was the Under Secretary of State for Air, Captain Balfour, who showed keen ministerial interest. What is more, having got into a flying suit, he takes the machine for a spin. An Under Secretary of State who can handle the fastest aircraft of the service at 300 miles an hour. 19 Squadron, with nine others, were Spitfire equipped just as war was declared in September 1939. A Battle of Britain Spitfire of 609 Squadron. How was it armed? How was it built and flown? Was it as good as legend supposes? Eight guns were fired by a simple button on the pilot's control column. The reflector sight worked on a Victorian music hall illusion known as Pepper's Ghost. There were four guns in each wing, 0.303 inch Brownings, each with around 300 rounds. Belted and fed from boxes to enable the fighter to be quickly rearmed in battle. A good ground crew could rearm and refuel a Spitfire in under eight minutes. During the Battle of Britain, 30 Spitfires were armed with two 20mm Hispano cannon but the thin wings had to have bulged fairings to accommodate the bulky cannon magazines. <clears throat> Due to the tendency of the early cannon to jam, machine guns were preferred. They were traditionally protected by the application of doped fabric to the gun ports. By the onset of the Battle of Britain, the variable pitch propellers of Spitfires and Hurricanes had been fitted with a constant speed unit. In the simplest terms, an automatic in place of a manual control. It meant that pilots could use full combat power without the danger of over-revving the engines. The primary flying controls were manual, operated directly by the pilot. Though the landing flaps did operate by compressed air. The radio, wireless in 1940, was the TR-9, an HF-AM set which could be picked up by an all-wave domestic radio. People listened enthralled to the new lexicon of combat. Scramble, Angels 1-5, Bandits, Tally Ho, and the screams of boys trapped in blazing cockpits. A preserved Mark II built by Westlands in 1940. It's undergoing a major overhaul. Tony Bianchi, Spitfire pilot and restorer of wartime aircraft, is responsible for the overhaul. Okay. Morning. How's it going? Well, I think this camshaft's okay, but we're going to have to check the other one just to be on the safe side. Well, we've been lucky with these, haven't we? Yeah, well, this the 1940 Spitfire, hours, which could do about 350 miles per hour, Good. was a simple machine. It had no electronics. The instruments are operated by vacuum or pressure. The fuselage, a hollow alloy tube. Were these formidable fighters well-engineered? 
generally they're well-made aeroplanes. Uh, you you find a, a few things on them which aren't very nice, but you you can't really tell whether they're, that's in manufacture or the work of a repair station. The real heart to the aeroplane is the Merlin engine, which was fitted in the Hurricane and the Mustang, and and it's got more than adequate power, largely due to its excellent supercharging and. Uh, the ideal thing is to have a properly supercharged engine with a, a carburetor, which is exactly what this is. And it, uh, it started off at, what, a thousand horsepower and eventually doubled in power. But what was the Spitfire like from the pilot's point of view? Squadron leader Paul Day, a jet fighter pilot who also flies the Spitfires of the RAF's memorial flight, assesses a 1940 Mark I, which actually fought in the Battle of Britain. Okay, of the things which are possibly undesirable as a design feature, because of the left-hand positioning of the throttle quadrant where it needs to be, it means the undercarriage controls are on the right, and consequently immediately after takeoff, one changes hands, so that's a little undesirable. Flaps, which are here and reasonably well positioned for operation, have no function in terms of uh, performance flap like a Messerschmitt slats. They are simply either down or up, and for most of the time on a Spitfire they would be up, so they offer you nothing other than full drag for landing. Of the rest of it, it's not badly positioned in terms of instrumentation, except that the engine instruments, which are clustered over on the right-hand side, are not particularly attention-getting in terms of you having a problem during a period of high workload, I think the first thing you would know is oil on the windscreen or smoke. Because of the addition of the armoured glass and the columns here, it very much restricts vision forward. There would be a reflector gun sight here, which would restrict it even further. These panels are not particularly good. Quality of the glass here is actually extremely poor and distortive, and therefore will cut down the range at which you're going to see somebody. That having been said, there are also problems now in that it is very difficult to turn one's head around and look backwards, which one needs to do because it's where the problem will arise most of the time. For that, we have a tiny little makeup mirror here, so you're scanning a very small fixed piece of sky. Out front, there's a good six, eight feet of nose, ten feet of nose if you're talking Griffin Spitfire, under which all manner of nastiness can be going on. For instance, even nowadays, low level in, in a Griffin Spitfire, at 500 feet, three mile, the next three miles is blind to you under the nose. You then come to what can you see actually out of the cockpit. And of course, what you can see is mainly this wonderful elliptical wing under which all manner of other problems are going to be hiding. So all in all, the wing is wonderful, but the wing is very, very much in the way in terms of what you'd expect of certainly a modern combat aeroplane. There's far too much nose, and because you're constrained in the cockpit, actually seeing behind you where the trouble normally comes from is somewhat of a labour of love. It's light and agile, and it is given the lineage of uh, other World War II fighters well up in its class. It has the clear benefit that it's got an excellent CSU, i.e. a variable pitch propeller. Throttle quadrants where you, want to, where you want it to be. The actual system for arming and firing the whole thing was where you want it to be, and extremely simple, not unlike some modern fighters. Given the small cockpit, you can, in fact, get an awful lot of back stick with quite a reasonable amount of aileron. So all in all, yes, as a, as a dogfight aeroplane of that era, it's pretty good. So, as it turned out, Reginald Mitchell got it more or less right. I think Mitchell got it absolutely right, yes, indeed. He was the quantum jump in fighter design, and I think had we not had it, we could have been in big trouble. <laughs>